hello I don't know how long you've been watching the channels but I wonder if you've figured out that I can't pronounce the word H even after how many years 30 years no um, about 27 years in England I still can't pronounce the word H blitz 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 um, bang bang is rain heavy rain very gray still snowy but gray mm. um, general zaluzhny gave a big interview to the economist what are my thoughts about it um, these are going to be questions that have been picked out that i've found repeated in dms and in emails and on patreon um, i know that i might not have got to yours and i love you for asking and i'm going to try to do a lot of catching up including with old messages I've got over the last few months. I, I plan to put aside time to do that. Anyway, in into this we go. Zaluzhny. Um Well, I can't say anything military, even though there were questions about Zaluzhny's remark that Moscow will make an effort on Kiev again. But there are two things that are quite striking, I thought, about that interview, which he gave to economist, which really means to Arkady Ostrovsky. Um, number one, um, it's very important to see that the Ukrainian state is doing pluralism of messaging. So don't see messaging in isolation. So some representatives of the state are there to say almost giddily optimistic things. Others are there to soothe and reassure. Yeah. Yet others are there to give a relatively realistic analysis. Yet others are there to say the most manipulative things possible to get more weapons from the West. Um, and obviously in this interview, Zaluzhny is being a realist and he is asking for more military support explicitly and concretely. And it's very important that that's not incompatible you see, that's the important point, with much more nauseatingly optimistic messages you hear coming out of other bits of the Ukrainian state. It's an economy and it's almost like a carousel where each person has their own lane of messaging. It's the first thing I'd say. Second thing I think that's striking, that's obvious to all of us really, is that there's a very big cultural difference between the two militaries. Um, and that the non-Soviet nature of Zaluzhny's understanding of what he's doing isn't just to do with a difference in military culture, it's also to do with a difference in culture more generally. So I think that the way the two militaries are operating says something about the difference in military cultures, but it also says something about the ways in which Ukraine is not Russia. Um, could Putin take Kiev in 2023? Well, because I shouldn't say anything military, let me put it like this. It's very difficult to detect a coherent strategy toward Ukraine's outcome in this war from the West, let alone a strategy for a post-war Ukraine. That is a glaring empty space. Um, but um, all the major Western powers are committed to Putin not taking Kiev. So that's in itself a very powerful consideration. That will be completely unacceptable to any major Western players. The first thing to say. The second thing to say is even though um, we shouldn't entertain this possibility as a likely one, um, and I don't know what to say about whether on some level they'll attempt it. What the tempting means, I don't know. But what we should say is that hypothetically, if Putin were to take Kiev, if we put aside the humanitarian catastrophe that that entails, um, that would be the greatest defeat Russia has experienced in modern history. Still, because they have a bit of territory um, which is destroyed and over which they exercise neither hard nor soft power. 
it's a complete catastrophe. Um, and eventually, of course, they'll lose it even if they take it. So um, conquests in Ukraine, even if they were possible for Putin, would in historical terms go down as catastrophic defeats, even defeats in military terms. Um, next question, are we supportive of Ukraine taking Crimea? I've, I've got that question a few times and it, I, I've got it factually because I want to say some things big picture about Crimea and about the um, implications, including the cultural implications for Russia of potentially losing Crimea. Um, but putting that aside, I think that the position of the United States at the moment this is a factual uh, uh, claim, is that they're unsettled, insofar as you can generalize, but they are more aligned with the reality in which Ukraine doesn't take Crimea than the reality in which Ukraine does. I think that's the perspective of the United States, that an outcome in which Ukraine doesn't take Crimea is on balance preferable, but there is openness to contingency, evolution and uncertainty, and the commitment to um, Ukraine's um, sustenance as a state, as an independent state, um, but exactly how that territorially translates isn't clear as far as the United States is concerned at the moment. That's my reading. Um, why did your last video not work out well? Um, a few people have asked that question. Um, so I'll be very brief because this is self-indulgent, but it's not self-indulgent, it's about our community. Um, I think that th there are three reasons, only one of them is, is worrying. Um, the, the worrying reason is that when you don't post, um, the algorithm separates you from your community. And so um, on this channel, which is not designed for growth at all, it's designed for community engagement. Um, we engage regularly and we, we don't get detached. Um, but here it's, a, it's still a smaller community than on the main channel. And when you don't post, little by little, YouTube separates you from your audience. And next time they log, like, log on, they're no longer uh, uh, shown or suggested your videos as options for clicking and that's just inevitable as a consequence of not posting for a while um and you can see it in the you know our um uh community on the main channel in in its widest circle these are people who return and watch more than one video was it about a quarter of a million um but more recently it's significantly less and that's understandable. There's been less content. I think that's mostly the, the issue. It's not about the declining interest in um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, although there is a declining interest, and that's reflected too, I think, if you look at the channels covering this. And the other two reasons are the video was very badly packaged, and um, that's a fault of mine, that you, you can't just put things out on YouTube um, it, you know, if you want to be helped by this algorithm, you, you've got to package them like a bit of candy. And it was awkwardly packaged. Um, and in terms of the content, the video, I'd say, did very well. People watched it remarkably well all the way through. So in that sense, I'm not sure that um, there's, there's a reason to be concerned. Um, and I'm quite proud of the fact that I emphasize that particular point that there's a sense in which Putin is not a rational age I'm not saying he's going to use nuclear weapons but Putin is not a rational nuclear agent the way we typically understand that term rational that it's absolutely vital for us to understand um, at least out of curiosity if anything um, and virtually nobody has said that in public um, Partly because people who are engaging in it don't have the vocabulary to say it because they don't have any philosophical background. And public intellectuals with a philosophical background haven't talked about it in one case with John Gray, um, who is a 
British public intellectual, John has touched on it very briefly conversationally. So I thought this point needed to be put out there, and in that sense I was happy. But in terms of the packaging of the video, I need to reflect, and in terms of that separation from the community, it's a health reality I need to reflect on. And this is a question I've got several times too. Is Stephen Kotkin right that the Cold War never ended? And so this is risky because I'm in danger of not fully understanding Stephen Kotkin's sort of position on this. And I also know that Serhii Plohi, the wonderful Ukrainian historian, also takes the view that the Cold War didn't end. And I think Serhii Plohi is committed to persuading a few more people of the importance of at least that as an angle, as a framework of understanding recent history. The reason I personally am very slow to be moved on this, that I do think the Cold War ended, is because of several factors, and the key is this. Um, was there an opportunity to fundamentally realign relationships, the relationship between Russia and the West. Was that real? Was that more than just a one in a thousand chance? Yes. Um, there was real possibility for this. Huge mistakes were made by the Elton administrations. Huge mistakes were made by the West. Some of them were mistakes, some of them were clumsy consequences of U.S. domestic politics driving U.S. foreign policy. Um, so that stuff was real. And Russia's capacity to sustain itself as a moderately democratic state was also real. That was a real opportunity Russia missed. It wasn't just some kind of a mirage. It was possible. It wasn't a 50-50 chance. I think that this outcome that we've got now is catastrophic, but a direction, as a direction, it was probably more likely than not. But it, it wasn't a one in a thousand chance, Russia's democratic opportunity at all, much more likely than that. So because of this, I don't want to say that the Cold War didn't end because it seems to me that these openings were real and recognizing them for me means that it's constructive to speak in terms of the Cold War ending. And then there are other things, such as the vast discontinuities, and this we've discussed on the channels, between this sort of project that we're seeing um, Russia engage in and the um, Soviet project, vast discontinuities. Now, if you're on Russia's border, and you are with um, remarkable historical persistence, a victim of Russia's um, uh, uh, aggression, you see, from that pair of eyes, it's easier to jump more quickly to the idea that the whole thing is continuous. Um, but I'm still reluctant to um, uh, use that angle, um, but I'm open to being persuaded about why it's... Um, analytically useful and of course I'm not a professional historian so therefore I'm particularly patient to listen to formulations and reformulations of that claim but I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical and slow to move on it as a useful um, as a useful fundamental angle how much is support for Russia in Western countries a product of Western of Russian disinformation um, I was just speaking about this to a journalistic institution um, this past week. Think of it as soil that is our soil, domestically produced soil. And the Russians are throwing seeds on it that are seeds for various kinds of you know, toxic um, plants to grow. Um, our soil has problems, but not all the things would happen that are happening if the seeds weren't thrown in. Um, so my inclination is always, given the way this gets discussed, to advise you to not take the maximalist view 
of the consequences of Russian interference. That's my first bit of advice. Um, more often than not, it's A, less professional than it's made out to be, and B, less influential than it's made out to be. And there are a lot of extremely dangerous claims being made in Britain and the United States about how political outcomes were achieved by Russian interference. Um, I think that is, it's uninteresting if that's a slight mischaracterization of the Russian interference. What's interesting is that it's a mischaracterization of um, the domestically grown, as it were, crises of trust we're experiencing. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, I think that you've got to look at seeds being thrown into a, a soil that has real problems and um, m sort of taking a maximalist view of the, you know, what the seeds in themselves do is, is dangerous and might actually get us into a place that the Russians want us to be in. And that is that we become unconstructively blind to the domestic democratic challenges that we face. What's the upper limit to Putin's casualties? Um, that's a question about the Russian casualties. Sadly, there's no upper limit to Ukrainian casualties. Um, and, you know, we've got to take very seriously the extraordinary humanitarian crisis developing in Ukraine. Um, and the fact that we don't have good answers for it at the moment. Um, but um, I think that, well, if you ask me in a kind of cartoonish way, I'd say he'd take half a million dead Russian soldiers. He'd think that wouldn't destabilize the state. Um, why has Putin cancelled his annual address? Um, so Putin does this annual address. He cancelled it this year, I think for the first time in a decade. I think there are two comments there. Um, I mean, it's not easy to justify what's happening and cast it in a positive light, especially when you're communicating for several hours to the country. Um, so he, he's running out of sort of justificational candy that he can serve the population. And the second thing I would say is that he wants to um, instead be seen doing political and military um, you know, photo opportunities um, and prepare the country for part two of his war in 2023. And what we're seeing is that he's preparing part two with the same characters, the sort of conscious presentation of himself just recently with Shoigo and Gerasimov says, my little drama that I'm showing you here, the cast is going to stay the same for part two. Um, is it really true I think people um, emailed me a bit after the um, uh, Art Ray podcast chat. Is it really true that informing Russians doesn't help? Um, in other words, that Russians are in denial rather than in a crisis of information. Um, so that they, they don't have a problem of information that stops them from understanding what's happening in Ukraine. They have a problem of denial because it is something they can't face about the political arrangement um, they've accommodated themselves into under Putin over the last couple of decades. Um, there's an interesting, and, and, and so to, to face what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening to the future of their country, to the future of Russia, they've got to be able to, to admit that their political accommodation has ended in catastrophe. That's very difficult to admit. It couldn't have, surely it couldn't have, because it seemed like the correct way to live, the correct way to um, achieve sustenance and uh, existence that is, um, you know, viable in that country. Um, so they're struggling to face it. It's denial. It's not lack of information. Um, there's an interesting study that's just out that I haven't read that actually says something 
that is enormously obvious intuitively if you visit Russia. And that's the following thought, um, that it's not that people don't get how disastrous things are looking, uh, how much of a humanitarian catastrophe their government is causing in Ukraine, how much of a disaster for Russia's future the government has brought about, but it's rather that they think, oh my, surely to do that, the regime must have some kind of good reason that we don't have access to. That's actually enormously, I mean, really, and yes, I haven't been, you know, for three or four years to, to that country, but I can guarantee you that is so palpable. You really feel that on the street. Um, and that's fascinating. So it's a kind of a, a sense of um, some kind of um, implicature of adequate justification that can't be transparent to you, but must be there because otherwise this disaster wouldn't have been created by my government. Surely, 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 surely. Last question um, is, well, basically, why do I keep recommending The Economist? Um, well, we've just talked about the Zaluzhny interview in, in The Economist. So let me um, say that um, there's a risk I'll go on around here. So if you if you've had a, a, a lovely um, chat experience, you can lo you can log off now. But as a risk, I'll do a three or four minute rant now. Let, let's let's try <laughs> let's try for me not to do a rant. Um, so I don't super super recommend anything uh, because actually you've got to construct your own informational environment. My recommendation of the Economist is about. Um, factual reliability and a minimal adequacy of analysis whereby you don't see face plants. So therefore I'm not recommending it as a publication that might on you know economic policy lean center right. I'm, I'm recommending it um, as a um, together with the Financial Times, perhaps, as a reliable source of the basics and some basic analysis, too, that's applicable, whether you've had a track record of voting the Republican or whether you, 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 you like Bernie Sanders or whether you don't think Bernie Sanders is left enough or green enough. It just doesn't really matter. It's completely ideologically apart. So it's not to do with The Economist's political slant. Um, the, the problem that, let, let me do the sort of soft version of the random, like we're having a coffee together. Um, I don't like, and I'm not speaking really about me, I'm speaking about me as an embodiment of a collective readership. I don't like being disrespected by publications in terms of my time. And there are a lot of major newspapers who and this has actually got slightly better after the war, but up until the war were disrespecting me, not me, but the hypothetical readership, disrespecting me. And I don't like being disrespected. So what do I mean by that? I mean that there were many well-known newspapers, serious newspapers in the Western world where I could read something in seven minutes and then I'd need to spend 20 minutes fact-checking it. Um, and maybe I couldn't even fact check it. Um, so that is very, very disrespectful. Very, very disrespectful. And it's um, long term is toxic, actually, to lower one's standards of accuracy as a major journalistic institution. And I'm not talking about bias here. I'm actually talking about accuracy um, because it's irreversible the damage you do to yourself is irreversible. And I could rant about this for an hour, but let me just add a microscopic sub-rant. Sub and that is that we need to reevaluate the institution of fact-checking. I'm a huge admirer of the approach which says, no matter how flawed our major institutions are, we need them, our major journalistic institutions. So my YouTube colleague, Konstantin Kissin, 
recently wrote a, a very unwise, in my view, Twitter thread about how we might need to give up on the BBC. Um, and I think that's a, a really serious mistake because when we're saying let's get rid of the BBC uh, or let's get rid of the New York Times, now that's, that's different. The BBC is much more explicitly still trying to serve the whole population. The New York Times sadly isn't anymore, uh, but it should. Um, what we're saying is this island that we are on is not workable anymore. This and that is not good on it. But our alternative isn't another island, it's just being in the sea. Being in the sea, let's say in Britain, is our alternative to the BBC. The BBC is an island, and if 40% of what it does is problematic, well, we've got to be viscerally critical, but in principle supportive of the BBC regathering itself. And also we have to acknowledge the enormous pressures that an institution like the BBC is under. If we, as somebody who doesn't like 90% of what the BBC does, we still need to be committed to it, sadly, for people who love to hate on institutions, sadly we need to be committed to it, uh, even if we're 90% uh, uninspired by what they do or offended by what they do. So. How, how is this connected with the institution of fact-checking? Um, if you look at some of the, and the BBC is an organization I, I do have some inside knowledge of too. Um, the BBC is an organization that can do the most extraordinary work at the level of accuracy, at the level of ascertaining what went on, how did a set of events come about. Um, and these opportunities that the BBC has, and a small number of other journalistic institutions in the world have too, are really unique. I mean, it means putting some really high level professionals on a question for 18 months and giving them the resources of time, the resources of staff, the resources of money too. And only that kind of work can tell us about certain things going on in the world. If that kind of work just simply ends, and that kind of work is at risk actually, globally, then it's like a black curtain coming down. There is gonna be, for instance, aspects of um, Chinese politics, Chinese society, this is gonna be dark for us, we're just not gonna know. Because no number of Matt Taibis on Substack are going to be able to tell us any of that. Huh? So that kind of journalistic um, work is so important that unless we have a darkness descent, and th these institutions do this incredible work. But what does the BBC then also do? The BBC will often get um, a fact-checking section up on its website, take an issue, that needs fact-checking and assign two youthful kids who are freshly in the organization to do the job. And so the fact-checking that this institution comes up with is nowhere near the standard of its own best journalistic work. And what happens is that very often um, fact-checking ends up either being partly wrong, partly factually wrong. So that's to say, um, they get an issue 75% right, which is catastrophic. It's catastrophic to fact-check somebody, to fact-check a YouTube channel, to fact-check another journalistic organization and only get it 75% right. It's irreversible toxicity. Irreversible toxicity as far as your epistemic credentials go. So you'd better get it damn right if you're fact-checking, right? Um, you should get the facts right. But if you are fact-checking somebody trying to get the facts, you should really get the facts right. And the second thing is that we've often seen non-factual fact-checking. And this is so damaging. It's profoundly damaging. Now, I'm going to exaggerate, but you can't fact-check if somebody is a bad person. Yeah? You can't fact-check if somebody has the wrong way of thinking about an issue. No, you can only fact check specific things, whether you're talking about pandemic measures, 
whether you are talking about some matter of history that's come out in the context of culture wars in the West, whether you're talking about something going on in Russia or in China, has to be specific. You know, you, you can fact check if Barack Obama visited Mongolia, yeah? but you cannot fact check whether Barack Obama is patriotic enough. You know, you just can't. You, you, you've got to understand that fact-checking cannot cover the vast majority of delusional perspectives in the world. Fact-checking is only about glaring matters of fact and nothing more. And when you do it, you've got to do it well. Anyway, so I managed to avoid the rant that I was at risk of giving, but I ended up giving a rant on a separate topic that wasn't as important as the rant I wanted to give, so that didn't work out well. But anyway, um, lots and lots of love and talk very, very soon and happy Sunday.